Evo Spallatin, thank you very much for joining us. Um, you were part of a staff investigative group with the Committee on Foreign Affairs uh, in the in the U.S. Congress, that's and that's right. that's how your name uh, comes attached to the the Jonestown story and to the aftermath of it. And we'll work through some things. And and I really appreciate you taking the time to, to talk with us. Your perspective is. Um, in my experience thus far, a, a, a unique one, and so okay. I'm grateful for that. When did Jonestown or the People's Temple, when did this first enter your, your consciousness? Was it something that you were aware of before the big event of Jonestown, no. or when did no. it first enter your consciousness? Wait, it was almost simultaneous with the event or within 24 hours afterwards because the congressman who had been assassinated, Leo Ryan, was on, on the was a senior member of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the House mm. of Representatives, and he and I knew him personally not very well, but I was asked by the chairman, or not asked, directed by the chairman of then the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Clems of Lockie of Wisconsin, yeah. to be part of the three-man group that would investigate this assassination of the member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, and then became known Jonestown, Guyana. Yeah. So your investigation, really the, you know, the, 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 the central point at the outset was to investigate the assassination of the congressman. That's but correct. What I've, what I've read in, in the report uh, that, that came out, you sort of inevitably got drawn into the broader story. Oh, yes. We did a considerable examination of many documents and interview scores of people on the origins of Jim Jones and what he did in Indiana, his tenure there, his fleeing Indiana and going to then, then California, uh, Ukiah in California and San Francisco and ending up in Guyana and creating this uh, a unique or unusual, uh, what, I don't know what to call it, uh, middle of nowhere in the jungles of Guyana. Sure, yeah. And it became, became known as Jonestown. Yeah. Well, well, we'll work through some of that. Now, you said you, that you knew Congressman Ryan. You didn't necessarily know him well, but but, but you knew him. Right. Um, and, of course, the tributes, you know, that are made in the immediate aftermath of, of Jonestown are all positive. And, I mean, not that, not the, you know, there's any requirement for there to be anything but, but positive. Um statements about someone, but, um, you know, there has been some question about, on his part, about whether there was a, maybe a, a little incautiousness on his part, perhaps a little bravado, as you, as you studied that at the time, or as you, as you look back on it now, do you think that, that Congressman Ryan, of course, the, obviously the people culpable for his assassination are the people who committed the assassination, but as you look back, as you studied that situation, did it seem that, that maybe he was insufficiently cautious? No, I don't, I, don't, I, I don't subscribe to that position. I could, it's plausible that some other people might subscribe to that. I think he was a very conscientious member of Congress he was res he was doing what members of the Congress basically have two functions: one is to represent their constituents, and one is to serve to serve them. And he was responding to constituent complaints about other family members being either held against their will or outright being under under abuse, and rather persistently over a period of time. And he. Uh, said, I've got to go there to find out what's going on yeah. and determine what the facts are and so on. And he, yeah, yeah. So I, 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 I don't think it ever, I, I don't recall any evidence that it ever crossed his mind that, I mean, he might be in danger in the sense of being, uh, couldn't complete his mission or that, uh, that would uh, you know make fun of it would be ridiculed or but I don't think there was any sense by anyone that I know recall at this point of any permanent damage or violence in, in yeah. the, to that degree right yeah but in retrospect there's no doubt that everybody was wrong on that point mm. there yeah. now 
I think our report demonstrated a lot of evidence that there, in other words, the worst case scenario happened, but no one thought that the worst case scenario was going to happen. Yeah, and that, I mean, that's even an interesting part of the story as well, which, which your report touches on. Um, you know, I'm kind of, you know, deciding, trying to decide where to, where to go next, but what you just said, yeah. you know, the, the embassy, if I understand correctly, you know, the U.S. Embassy in Guyana, or Guyana, didn't, um, didn't um, really, um, what, seem to focus on the issue of Jonestown until I think June of 1978, when a, a memo was sent, if I remember correctly, um, to the State Department in the U.S., basically asking for permission, you know, the embassy was asking for permission from the State Department to, if I remember correctly, effectively ask the government of Guyana to take some control over what was happening in Jonestown. Because one, one of the really interesting lines in the, in the report is that it was almost as if Jonestown was an independent nation within a nation. Well, there, in, 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 to a significant degree, it was. I personally am of the belief that there was bribery between Jim Jones, I, and Jim Jones in Guyana, but we could not find evidence of that. We mm. we heard that that had been the case. We were told that was the case. That there were a couple middle level, maybe even senior level people in the Guyana government that were on the take, but we never could substantiate that. We could not find that. Yeah. And it's sheer, sheer speculation then and still now, to best my knowledge, no one was able to find that information out. And this uh, would, if, if, what you, I'm sorry, if what you're saying is correct, then that would make sense of something I heard from, um, from an officer uh, from Guyana who was one of the first to arrive after November 18, 1978 who basically did describe a hands-off um, a hands-off situation where he, he had command of that northern part of Guyana and and he heard reports he, he heard he heard rumors and stories that yeah. stuff was going on and I said well did you keep an eye on it did you la launch an investigation and basically he said no he, he no no I don't think there was any situation I the Guyana government had no interest in doing an investigation. The U.S. government had, you know, had, going back to the preliminary information, because they were here, there were some people complaining, well, first of all, complaining to the congressman, the congressman complaining to the State Department, these are some of the charges that are being made. Can, we, can you substantiate them? And they were unable to substantiate that. The, the, the area of Guyana where Jonestown became located was consciously where it was by Jones because he didn't want to be investigated by anybody. Yeah. It's a totally consistent, in retrospect, we now know, at least I believe I know, there was a totally consistent pattern with Jim Jones. Jim Jones would do his thing, control his people, mm. in retrospect, control them throughout his career but every time the authorities started getting a, maybe a bit suspicious or a bit wondering, we said, well, I'll move from Indiana where, you know, I'm mm -hmm. not welcomed anymore and go to Ukiah. And then Ukiah, he found out that was not, he wasn't welcoming after a while. Then I'll go to the, you know, which was actually a conservative rural part of California. Yeah. And he ends up in a very liberal, tolerant, easygoing San Francisco Bay Area. But even there, you know, even there, you know, he had figured out, by the way, by that time he had 900 people plus under his control. He had access to all their social security checks. Mm. You know, he had a pretty solid situation, but he, I th he started feeling heat from the local authority. There were some local authorities that were endorsing him because they thought he was you know, great example of socialism. And all, and, you, you mean know, in San Francisco? Yeah, I mean, there was a split. Yeah. About a, he, yeah. was a, well, he, he, he was canny. He was wily. He, he yeah. exploited all that attitude. Yeah. So even, even good old, you know, open-minded, liberal-minded San Francisco, the, the reality was now we know that the charges of abuse and being held against your will were 
just didn't seem to be plausibly true, but became ultimately very true. Yeah. And he, he, he was always just a, a bit ahead of the authorities. Why he chose Guyana, we never found that out. We don't know. I don't, I, I, I'm curious if you're ever going to find out what, what is it that, why do you go to Gu Guyana as opposed to Chile or, you know, whatever, Panama. I mean, pick any, pick any country. No, I, I mean, just thinking off the top of my head, it might be, you know, one thing I've heard from a number of people is they'd never heard of the country until Jonestown. That well, I, I think part of it, Guyana was, uh, you know, is an easy go, I mean, a, a fairly remote country, fairly s small, relatively insignificant in international affairs. Yeah, it's kind of a spot where people are going to leave him alone. He wanted to be left. To, he wanted to have control and master his situation. And yeah. Um, yeah. so now, yeah. so I personally believe that the Guyana officials had no idea who he was, didn't care who he was. And the fact is, I think that he was able to slip them $50,000. I'm just making the number up, you know, $20,000 or cash or something to what the right person so that they make sure that they don't look too much at him carefully. And frankly, you know, except for these few complaints, he didn't bother the Guyanese people, didn't bother the Guyanese government. And, you know, it was, I think the authorities probably viewed him, them giving him X amount of dollars as kind of like a rent payment. I, we never found that out. I'm just speculating now. Right. No, no, no. I hear and, you. And, and don't forget, I mean, this place, uh, I forget how many miles it is from Georgetown, the capital, but it's a south. There's no roads to get there to speak of. Right. And, I mean, you theoretically could go in a big Land Rover style thing, but you go like in potholes and there, there's just right. no, that, that, the isolation was just tremendous. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, to me, I recall being when I was in Jonestown, one of the things that struck me was, uh, there were still clothing and shoes that had been accumulated for the 900 plus dead people. It reminded me of a of a room that I'd seen in the in the Holocaust Museum in the United States. Wow, wow. Well, let's 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 let me see. I want to come back and and talk about that. Let me just just make a note to come back to when you actually do go to Jonestown. Um, and I want to stay in in um, Guyana. Just one thought I have is, I mean. Mm -hmm. um, your, your report does mention that you have this relationship between the Jonestown member, Paula Adams, if I remember correctly, and mm -hmm. the, um, the, the Guyanese uh, ambassador to the States. And you know, that was you know, probably mixed into this. Uh, why did Jonestown pick Guyana? Maybe one other in addition to the isolation. Um, you know, at that time, I think the government was socialist, right? And, and yeah, I mean, it was kind of you know sympathetic toward yeah socialist, you know, and yeah. they you know it wasn't uh, it wasn't like Argentina, more right, you know, the the right wing elements did don't exist in Guyana the way they express themselves in a but look, but Argentina and Colombia, Brazil, those are huge economies and those are big countries. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, I swear to God, if you walk down the street here where you live or where I live and you ask people Guyana, I would say nine out of 10 people don't even know it's a country. No. That's I mean, the whole idea. Sure. And if they have heard of it, they think it's in Africa. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, here's a, here's a quote. And I'm, I'm interested in, in you reflecting on this just in terms of um, trying to think of a more sophisticated word, but I'm just interested in the vibe that you picked up when you were in Guyana, trying to talk to these officials. I've got this quote here from the report. Mm -hmm. um, that, for example, the government of, of Guyana refused to permit the staff investigative group to interview Guyanese government officials. That yeah. fact has resulted in a conspicuous void in our report. Um, so, I mean, just what, I'm trying to think of a more sophisticated word, but vibe is the only one that comes to my mind. But, you know, when you're down there with these officials, I mean, here you are representing the U.S. government. You're representing the U.S. Congress, this, this investigation. One of, our, one of our congressmen has been, has been murdered in that country. Right. What, is, what is the vibe like as you're, as you're trying to work with these Guyanese uh, officials? Uh, frustrating, but, a, you know, it's the, it's the 
negative manifestation of being a sovereign country. We have no right, we, the United States government, has no right, or individual governments under our under the for, under sovereign the notion of sovereignty have the right to control their own countries, and this goes into the larger issue, which is a dominant issue of the 20th century, and that in post World War II, the issue of human rights. You know, what right do we have to tell modern day China how they should treat their people on democracy or access to any other or human rights issues and so on? Mm. Well, we we claim. You know, everybody, to the degree that Guyana is a member of the United Nations, we, could, we took that angle, but it didn't go very far. And the bottom line is, uh, God bless them, but Kissinger's perspective still prevails. Sovereignty prevails in international affairs. Mm. And that's the trump card. We, yeah. don't, we don't allow people to investigate our country. They don't allow us to visit unless we decide it's in our interest to do it. How, how long were you on the ground altogether there in Guyana? You know, that I'd have to, I'm, it's got to be three nights. Oh, okay, nights. so not a, not a real, so I mean, was maybe it? One, I mean, maybe four, I mean, yeah, it, it's the document, sort of, but I don't have it in my head. Sure, sure, it sure. Wasn't, you know, it wasn't, you know, we were 24 or 48 hours in Georgetown. Mm. You know, we got there, stayed there for a night or two, tried to meet people, didn't get very far, interviewed mm. the variety of uh, officials in the embassy. Yeah, arranged to to be taken to, and again, you know, they did not have, they weren't required to allow us to go to Jonestown, right? You yeah. know, so they, but they, we were, we were, we were reasonably confident that we could work that out, and it didn't work out. We got the journal. Yeah. They were cooperative in that sense, you know, but it was a, what I would call very minimalistic. That they they got you to to Jonestown. Yeah, well, we needed their cooperation. The United States right. government wasn't going to go in there unless the Guyanese government agreed. Yeah. You know, yeah. And frankly, you know, I, I don't even, I'm trying to remember if there was any, do we even have a foreign aid program with Guyana, which I don't think we did. Well, I mean, this is what I was going to ask you, because one, one of the congressmen um, in the, you know, that I read, and I don't have it right in front of me now, yeah. but it was kind of an indirect statement, but one of the congressmen in the, in the, um, hearing when, when you showed up to um, to testify, right. there was kind of an implication that you know we we were giving we're giving Guyana funds, and the implication seemed to be that maybe you know future funding should be contingent on them helping us find out what happened. Uh, but that could, that could easily, I mean, if if there was a funding program, it was would have been a very modest one, a couple, yeah, of, yeah. I'm guessing five to ten million bucks. Yeah, economic development. It, you know, I don't. We did not have a military exchange program with Guyana. I don't believe. Right. And so, with no military training program, which is a very common way to get into a relationship with other countries. Yeah. Because of, the, because of their as a proclivity to be. Uh, o o more open to Moscow than we would want them to be at that time. Because don't forget, yeah, yeah. there's still the Cold War going on. Right. Yeah. So, uh, if there was a modest uh, five or ten million dollar program, that would not. I don't think. I don't think it was unless if we as a staffers would have came back and reported to the committee that we had evidence that there was bribery, that we had evidence that they were collusion between yeah. the Guyanese government and that would have, have easily resulted in the aid being cut off. Yeah. But that never it never got to that point. What, what, and then the other issue, yeah, because uh, you, you I guess you're looking at this from the military and national security standpoint, you know, there was some speculation that there was a relationship that there was some intelligence interest in Guyana. But there really wasn't. Hmm. And there really wasn't yeah. that we could find, and we were we're pretty confident of that finding. Yeah, I mean, on on the on the U.S. side, there may or may not have been, but you know, these I have to be very blunt. These Guyanese officials are not very sophisticated. We I mean, weren't mm -hmm. we're not sophisticated at that time. I can't speak for them today. Yeah, but the, the, that's no, not this, is, this is small. You know, U.S. Intelligence Committee had no need to have any interest there because there was nothing to be interested in.
I hear you. I hear you. You're really blunt about it. Yeah. This this question, I, I'm just asking, you know, just your own opinion, just given mm -hmm. your, your experience working in, in foreign affairs. But I and perhaps there has been, you know, a, a, an, an investigation over the past 40 years. But I mean, this seems like a huge question, you know, was a foreign government, you know, what was the relationship between this foreign government and this entity within that country where over 900 Americans died? But I don't know of, and I can't say that I've, I've done deep digging in this, but I don't know of any, other than your investigation, I don't know of any big investigation that took place 15, 20 years later. They said, look, we really do need to figure this out. Are you aware of any such investigation? And, and all, all, I, all I know is that uh, the Congressional Quarterly uh, is in the process of putting, has put together a podcast as of November 18th, 2019, of which I participated in, in a, th oh. about a five-hour interview. Really? Wow. Which is in the process of being, I guess, broadcast every Monday or every two weeks in which they get into this issue quite a bit and they spent a lot of time with me interviewing me trying to for me to say what their, sus their suspicions about the role of the U.S. intelligence agency which mm -hmm. I said there was none about them about the role of the United the Guyanese government which I shared with them I thought was suspicious but we couldn't substantiate it uh, and by the way, I think you know the the point is that it was a per, it, everybody that was involved in this, the guy in these government officials, and Jim Jones was happy because Jim Jones could be left alone by people and do his trick and maintain his control. He didn't really he didn't really ask much from the guy in these government. They no, it wasn't no. like he asked them to be in a nice neighborhood in Georgetown or something, no. or to be or to be an integral part of their governmental decision making process. He had his little power enclave and he didn't need and he for whatever reason didn't need to add to it. Yeah. And yeah. what was happening was it was falling up what prompted I mean who I believe that some if it wouldn't have been Leo Ryan going down there, ultimately the only way that that I mean that it would have been maybe at one point 20 years later or 10 years later, five people would have walked out of, into the jungle back to Georgetown, which now that I recall, I think is about 30 miles at least, and mm -hmm. survived. Yeah. And there would be a big hullabaloo about how did this woman and the two little kids get out. Matter of fact, I think a woman and a child did get out. Yeah, yeah. Probably, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that, that was – the downfall of Jim Jones. He could never let that happen. Yeah, he couldn't. My only point is that there was there were no special. Jim Jones was very happy with the status quo, except he, but it was started to started to slowly fall apart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and the riot visit just precipitated it. Yeah, and, and, and it seemed. You know, the charges seem so outlandish and so strong. And don't forget, you know, Jim Jones was, was wily, and he had other people offsetting those charges, saying, no, the people here are really happy. And there were people that had been snookered. There, well, the, your report says that, that there were right. some people who were genuinely pleased about... Well, I think mean, when we say... They clearly were brainwashed from our perspective. When you say genuinely, that they bought into it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, I mean, I think that they... I, don't, I think they, they had lost their individuality and yeah. they had bought into the collective system. Yeah. And, and there were, but, and it, and it was a tragedy, especially for their young children who had no say in anything. Sure. Yeah. You know, and, um, and just don't forget that, that, I mean, now that it's all coming back to me, the that tragedy of Jim Jones so emphatically screaming on the and the PA system, make sure you get the kids first. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. feel it, get the Kool Aid down, get it over with, and you know that's why it was Kool Aid because it was sweet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, anyways, it's kind of a no. I, I I hear you know it's just it's 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 mystifying to me, um, and I you know and and 
you know, you're you're limited, and you you are not really able to relieve the mystery. I mean, you 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 did your work, and and you wrote the report, or you co-wrote co-wrote the report. Right. Um. But it's just it's just mystifying to me because as I read books about the stories, I talk to people about it. You know, a, a lot of things have just been gone over again and again and again and again. But you know, this question about what was the government of Guyana doing and and you know, I mean, that just seems like this huge hole in the story. Like, what the heck was was going on? You guys go down there, and you know, you seem seem to to hit a brick wall. And you know, it's just it's amazing to me because I'm trying to think in terms of civilian body count. I mean, only nine eleven is bigger than this in That's the twentieth century. That's correct. There's no doubt about it. I just it's just mystifying to me. The, well, again, now, okay, so I'm just, I'm just Joe Blow, history teacher, but, you know, this, this congressman, you know, suggests, look, I mean, maybe we should make our aid contingent on, you know, finding out what happened. But, you know, apparently that, that, that didn't happen. Well, it did not happen, and also we, we could not, we're, you know, we're a very legalistic society, and yeah. we, we're very, you know, we could, this constant balancing about the rights of individuals and the and the then you you compound that by the rights of the American citizen living in another country yeah. and the rights of that country and sovereignty and so on sure. yeah. that it was a in in from Jones's perspective it was a brilliant move and it and it, it ultimately it, it all for me I understand your your frustration about the mystery and my only way to uh, out of that predicament and that's by the way a similar attitude that the congressional quarterly people that are had in their questioning of me too uh, they, they, this they just hmm. I guess there there's this notion that there there's we don't have all I mean I guess we don't have all the information. No. I don't think we ever will have all the information. And but the only consol the only consolation I can think of, from my perspective, and I have, it could be others, is that you know, another Jim Jones is not percolated. Another Guyana type thing is not on the horizon that I'm aware of anywhere. Which yeah. means we don't want that to happen again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. And by the way, we did not, you know, after 9-11, we created Homeland Security. Sure. We, we, we put, you know, 200,000, we hired 100,000 people. We're spending $50 billion a year in Homeland Security. Yeah. I don't know if we're getting our dollars worth, but we didn't do it after, we didn't do this after People's Temple. And maybe we should have done more. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. cultism is a integral, and well, that's the way I would define what's happening here, is an integral part of human behavior. But it's not unique to American behavior, no. and it doesn't seem to be uh, a growing threat to our own. Oper I mean, it it it's doesn't. I mean, cultism is cultism, and then is it any more stronger in American society than it was six hundred years ago or six thousand years ago? Mm. It doesn't seem to be. Yeah. So I, yeah. It. it mm. it, I guess what I'm saying is, it looks like it might be in a one-time only aberration. And but you want that actually you want it to be the case, You're right? Sure, yeah, that's yeah. right. But yeah. at the same time, you know, as a former government official, I, when I was a, at the Arms Control Sovereign Agency afterwards in the executive branch and the State Department, or as a senior congressional person, I don't, I want to do everything I can to, that we do whatever we can to make sure this doesn't happen again. Yeah, yeah. have we done everything we can? I don't know. I was pretty. I was very keen. On the White House, uh, that White House group that was looking into cultism, doing more investigations, and you could argue, you could argue that we could have convinced, you know, maybe the the, the Social Security fraud issue mm. could have been better examined by the Congress, but we couldn't convince the Ways and Means Committee to do it. Mm. They they viewed it as an aberration, and that's not. I it's it may be worth thinking about is it this is, is what degree of fraud is there in, inside the social security administration i mean five million americans live overseas today mm. yeah uh what percentage of those people are in social security what percentage are i don't know all i'm saying is those are the types of issues that government officials look at 
Yeah, yeah. Just one last question related to uh, sort of U.S. Uh, Guyana relations, and then yeah. I'm interested in just your your reflections on on Jonestown itself, and then we'll and then we'll we'll wrap up. Mm -hmm. do you do you know you know because Guyana certainly was not equipped to uh, to deal with with these these 900 plus bodies in Jonestown. Right. I mean, you know, U.S. forces, the very first U.S. forces are on the ground, I think, within 24 hours close to it. Right. Um, in, in that case, do you, do you know how that worked? Did the government of, of Guyana, did they invite the U.S. to come down, or did the U.S. in this case just say, we're coming down and... Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure that we said we wanted to come down and because... We had all the necessary assets. I mean, this is me speculating because I don't remember the fine detail, but I'm sure yeah. we wouldn't have gone down if they would have said, you can't go there. Right. The so we, had, we kind of convinced them, well, we're going to go there. We're going to take the bodies out. We're going to clean the place up. We're going to do basically everything for you because you're not going to be able to do it effectively, and we want to do it now. And uh, I don't know what – I don't – I'm not aware, I don't have any recollection if there was any agreement beyond that. Yeah. Now, you could have argued, I got what, you, what I was awaiting the question you could be asking is, why didn't we use that particular uh, asset to get more cooperation from the Guyanese government? Oh, that's interesting. Now, that, that is an, that's a worthwhile, interesting inquiry. Mm. That, uh, but it was... I guess, but you know that all that all transpired so quickly and so fast. That's what I'm that, thinking. Just the the sense of shock, you know, the the death right. of the congressman, just the the hor the horrific images on the cover of Time magazine and the news. Right, right. You want to clean it up. You want to get. You yeah. want to kind of close the chapter down. I mean, frankly, uh, let's be very honest about this. If it hadn't involved the death of a member of Congress, there would not have been a special House investigation. Mm. Mm -hmm. It would have been easier. I, I hear what you're saying. I mean, awful as it is to say it aloud, but just realities being what they are, it's far away. It's in a country I've never heard of. Um, the the general impression is that you know this is kind of a madhouse down there anyway. So right. if you if you you take the congressman out, then you know the the story is probably very different, right? It yeah. it just doesn't have the same degree. Uh, you know, and what what happens is that the State Department, you know, is it's it's worried about its degree of culpability and so on. Well, right, and this gets to I think you know one of the key things that you say in your report because the if I remember correctly, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but the embassy in 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 Guyana, June 1978, there had been you know the, a, a significant defector who had said, look, look, they're doing suicide drills and things like that. Right. And so the embassy in June 78 asked for permission from the State Department to approach the government of Guyana to say, look, can you try to get your hands around this? But the, the report back from the State Department was, you know, that might look like you're stepping on their sovereignty. And exactly, sort of exactly. And so it, it was, uh, you, know, it, you know, maybe a body had to show up at the embassy for the next step. I don't know, but that did mm -hmm. never, that never happen. Now, there were... Uh, I well, I can't remember now if a few people did get out. I mean, they did get out. There were survivors, but I'm there sure there were some who got out. Yeah. Well, no, I'm talking about survivors in you know three or four months earlier, and I thought. Yeah, you know, there was this. I, there were, and and but it it was. We tried to track that down, and that didn't go very far either. I think the reality was that a majority of the residents there had got hoodwinked. Mm. And bought into the system. But that, I'm afraid that's a statement of fact. You mean that in, in Guyana had had it, gotten it, in Jonestown? In Jonestown. Oh, oh, residents. You said yeah, yeah the residents. Yeah, the, the, the so-called community, or call it the residents. Yep. Yeah, I, it's such a it's such a fascinating story. Um, but, you know, where I mean, where was he going to go after Jonestown? That was kind of like the. Well, they were talking about going to Russia. They were talking about decamping yeah, well, to Russia next. I can assure you we had checked that out, and there was no – Russians uh, were not prepared to do anything close to that. Right, yeah, this was, this was delusional stuff. Right. So you're, you're in Guyana. You make your way to Jonestown then. So 
just walk us through this. And this is really the, the last thing I'll ask yeah. you about, so far as I can think right now. But uh, just 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 walk us through. I imagine you do you, you fly into the airstrip at, at Port Kaituma, and then you take the truck into Jonestown, and correct. Just, and just walk, walk us through that. Walk. walk. It was it was eerie. It was there was no. I mean, I don't know. Was there? I I can't remember if there was even a stray cat or dog running around. Wow. There was no no one living there. The barracks were stripped. There wasn't much to strip to begin with. But I do recall that very vivid scene of that one or two barracks or cabins full of shoes and clothing, which reminded me of Auschwitz when I went to Auschwitz years earlier. It was kind of eerie that that's, they were still, this is months later, but nothing, no one did anything, you know, there was, there's nothing there. Yeah. It was, you know, it's almost, you know, don't forget, it was amazingly humid and hot. And it, mm, yeah. I don't want to say, I don't want to go as far as saying that I could smell human because you couldn't. Yeah. But it just was, it was an ugly environment and, you know, very jung, jungle and swamp. Yeah. What had the, um, I, I'm, I'm, so this is, this is a couple months after yeah. the early 79. Yeah. Was that sign in the pavilion still hanging? You know, those who don't know the past are doomed to repeat it. Do, do you remember seeing that at all? Or I, I remember that, but I don't remember if the sign was there or not. There yeah. were, there was, I mean, it could have been there. I just don't remember. Yeah. It's the shoes and clothing that I remember, which I thought was kind of uncanny. I mean, I would have yeah. thought you would dispose of it or burn it or something. I don't know what. Yeah. Wow. How long were you there in Jonestown proper? It wasn't an overnight. Yeah. I mean, we, we, I, we, cause there was nowhere to, there, there's no motel eight. <laughs> Yeah, wow. Yeah. <laughs> we basically got the flight in, got the, the truck the last, I don't know, for a couple of, I don't remember that fine deal. We were there for a couple, five, six, seven hours, if that much. You know, we were escorted by Guyanese authorities and U.S. authorities. And yeah. as you were there, were you, were you, you know, I mean, you're, you're seeing what there is to see. And doing that kind of research, were you also trying to on the ground? They're trying to get more information from. Yeah, the but I mean, there was the, 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 the our so-called handlers knew nothing, and that was very conscious on their part, or the Chinese part. They were just facilitators, or you know, they enabled us to get there. They agreed for us to go there, you know. They, but they didn't. They didn't know anything. There were these were not knowledgeable people. Yeah, uh, that yes. escorted us. And wow. and it was a mixture of uh, U.S. you know officials from the embassy and and from the Guyanese government, but th there was no one. To, there was no we, aside from just getting our feel for the and seeing, which was important. We thought, and it, and it is a to, to get the no, notion of the remoteness and the starkness and the that that part was useful to. It was worth the effort. But we do. We didn't have any illusions that we were going to find some somebody's famous diary or you know some inside information that right. we hadn't. We had done much more interviewing and researching in Ukiah and California than that we did in Guyana, wow. just to try to understand this character. Yeah. When when your when your plane is flying out of Georgetown, uh, it's, it's forty. You know, it's forty one years ago now. We're looking at. Um, 41 years ago, a long time ago. Um, but what are your recollections of just whatever thoughts or feeling in your gut you had when that plane, you know, takes off from Johnson, whatever, whatever hopes you had when your plane lands in Georgetown, when your plane is leaving Georgetown, what was, what was your basic sense of things? Uh, that this, was, this had been a, a truly ugly human tragedy for these people. You wouldn't want to wish this upon your your best friend or your worst enemy. And uh, it was great to get the hell out of there, to be really yeah. blood about it. Yeah. But it was frustrating. I mean, not going there was not frustrating. It was, un, it was, it did enlighten us in that sense. I mean, going to the actual site. 
But it was frustrating. You got back to Georgetown and we demanded to see a few more officials because we went back to our effort to try to find out what was the relationship. You know, was there any, any could we substantiate an illegal or illicit relationship between uh, Jim Jones and the Guyanese government? And we just could not, we were, we're still suspicious. I'm still suspicious of that. Yeah. Uh, one of my colleagues has passed away since then, and Tom Smeaton is still alive, by the way. Yeah. Um, really? Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, no, I think then, then we got back and it took us a whatever time frame, another month or two, to put it all together and, and the best report we could find. Yeah. And, and so when you actually left the country itself, the feeling was one primarily of frustration of having basically run into a brick wall. Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, we, we did learn a few extra things and clarified certain things by going, so I don't want to view it as a total bust. Yeah. But, uh, you know, doubts and uncertainty and in, incomplete matters per persisted. Yeah. yeah. But it became a little more, the, the starkness was, I guess, just more was was obvious or more more evident than ever before. Yeah. About the about the environment. I mean that part was it was helpful because it truly does it does I think substantiate uh, it kind of it it confirms our deepest suspicion that this guy was just running away running away and he got to the spot where he he got in the corner and that was it. There was nowhere else to go. To the ends of the earth. Yeah, that's right. Well, I don't know. I'm still hoping that that well, book is going to get published. Be, that's be going to free to, uh, I will send you that uh, podcast site. Please do. Yeah. Uh, commercial Quarterly. Uh, be, feel free to. They interviewed me for about six hours. Wow. Uh, they have a lot, they've interviewed Ryan's family members. They had wow. interviewed Jackie Spears, who was the yeah. Ryan's uh, L.A. at that time, now as a congresswoman. Exactly, yeah. On the House, on the House Intelligence Committee. Yeah. Uh, but. Wow. Well, I please do send that. I, I'd, I'd love to. Uh, I'll send you that site, and then uh, feel free to give back to me if there's any follow-ups yeah. you might have. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you uh, you taking the time. You know, um, I talk to different people who have different perspectives and are different parts of the story. For me, this is a, you know, to be able to talk to somebody who in the aftermath is at a, at a governmental level who's trying to figure out what happened. Right. Although, you know, I think, uh, you know, huge questions remain and, and they'll probably sure. never get answered. I'm, I'm afraid, I mean, I, I'll be great if you could answer some of them. <laughs> I'm all for it. I don't want to. I don't want to suggest that everything there ever is to know about that tragedy is in our report. But I think there are lots of things in our report that are useful and helpful to understand yeah. it. I, I agree with that. They don't answer all the questions. There's no doubt about that. that. Sure. Yeah. Well, Evo Spalatin, I I really appreciate you. Um, you're taking the time. Thank you very much. Okay. All the best and stay in touch if you need anything else. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.